word this morning. I, you know, many times in the revival, there, there's a, there's a, 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 a focused aim to what I do. And the Lord has called me to move in what we have seen in this revival, miracles, signs and wonders, to preach the gospel, to see souls saved. And it's very rare that I get the opportunity to really preach to the saved, to the church. But I have a great desire and a burning passion to speak to God's people because without them there will never be a worldwide evangel evangelism that will see nations shaken. We need the body of Christ to be gifted, to be anointed, to be dangerous in the Holy Ghost. One thing you'll never replace is the fire of God. Sometimes we get to a place in God that we think like we need to go to, we need to change the script or change the message. And sometimes it can, can it be so simple and yet so profound? I want to say yes. The message never changes. Those that receive the simplicity of the gospel and let the fire of God burn on it, it will be as fresh and as new every day to those that walk in the Holy Ghost. I want to preach to you a message that I call a door standing open. I'm going to preach to you about prayer this morning. Prayer. Some of you might be yawning already like, oh... Let me tell you, you want to see revival, you want to walk in, in the realm that you see and read in the Word of God, you better be a man of prayer, a woman of prayer. Some of the greatest men I've ever met, some of the greatest women I've ever met are those that have literally carved and pressed and, and, and endured in the realm of prayer. I speak to many Christians, and if the truth be known, many Christians do not know and have victory in the realm of prayer. Because the devil knows the power of it. He does everything he can to close you down, to discourage you, to bring you in a place where you're too busy. Too busy. One of the greatest men of prayer I've ever met. And I don't say this with any bias, but my father is one of the greatest men I've ever met in prayer. I'm telling you right now, I've seen him all my life. My dad to this day is still up at 4.30 in the morning. You'll find him on his face. Let me tell you what God said to me when I came into ministry. He said this, what I'm about to do in your life is not because of you. But it is because of the faithfulness of your parents, your father and your mother. You see, my granddaddy, the, before that, my nan used to feel, my grandma, she used to feel for him in the night. And she would say, love, well, where have you been? He said, I've been on my knees praying for Nathan. I know that Satan longs to take him, but I am praying for him. You see, prayer leaves a heritage not only for you, but for the next generation. Oh, whew. when you pray, you lay a path, you lay a causeway that the next generation, they come up that slipway and they go straight into a highway to a whole new level in God. Some of the greatest rewards in heaven. They won't be big preachers. You, you mark these words. But it'll be some little widow woman somewhere. That every night I'm on this pulpit or every night you're walking out and going about your daily life. That widow woman, that woman, that man. They go in their room. They get on their knees and they pray. They pray. There's a woman back in England. I have many of these. But wherever I am, no matter what I'm doing, she never married. She suffered polio as a child. But my God, she prays for me. There's some grandmas in this house. You know who you are. 
you pray for me. And when we stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I want to tell somebody this morning, when I step up there, you're going to be stepping with me. Because when it comes to anything that God does in our lives, those that pray that pave the way will receive a great reward. Can you shout amen? amen. No, I said, can you shout amen? amen. I preach to you about a realm of prayer that God wants to take his church into. You see, there's a place of prayer that is personal prayer. It's a place that you need to frequently abide in. See, many times we should be the ones waiting for him, not him for us. When you're not a prayerful man or a prayerful woman, you will never see what's about to happen in your life. Your spiritual antenna will become so weak that it will take the booming voice of God even to catch your ear. I don't know about you, but I want to hear the whispers, not the shouts. This morning I want to talk to you about a realm of prayer that God wants to show His church, reveal to His church and for them to walk in it. I want to talk to you about the realms that the Bible speaks of. I want to preach to you this morning about why we pray. Many people don't even know why we pray. I've heard people say to me, why do I need to pray if God already knows what I'm going to pray before I pray it? What's the point? Well, I want to show you this morning, just by God's grace, something that the Lord has walked me through on the journey that I call into the miraculous. God will shape you in prayer. He will shape you. He will mold you. He will tune your ear. He will also increase your faith. In other words, you start to see differently. You hear differently when you're a man who knows how to get on his knees. You know, when I first came to Christ, I blew up to about 200 and something pounds. If you look at my, my wife looks at my early crusade, she's like, baby, you look totally different. <laughs> you know, I used to be in the gym training before I got saved. And then I got saved and I was like, I don't need to do that anymore. I'm saved. Then one night I was in the middle of Africa, thousands upon thousands in the field, and the whole crusade field started spinning like that. I was carrying so much weight, I got in the room, I said, Jesus, am I doing this for the rest of my life? I used to walk out of a service, and you ask my team, like an old man, I, I was aching. And I realized, and the Lord spoke to me, He said, Son, you're not carrying physically what I've given you to carry spiritually. You see, in order for me to walk in the realm that God had, I needed to get in that gym. I needed to get there and work that body to handle what God had given me. That's what prayer will do for you spiritually. When you pray, you're in the gym. You're increasing your capacity. You're increasing every area of your life to contain and to walk what God has for your life. Oh, come on, give God some praise. I believe that the Lord wants to bring every child of God into a place that we can begin to strategically pray, strategically bind the strong man, strategically enter into places and see victory and revival. Can you shout amen? One of the strongest battles you will ever face when it comes to walking with the Lord will be in the area of prayer. 
I remember when I first started to pray for revival, pray for signs and wonders. I'd go into my room full of the Holy Ghost. I'd come home from work. I'd be walking down the street thinking, I can't wait. I can't wait. I'd get on my face. I'd start praying. And two hours later, I'd wake up and think, what happened there? How could I fall asleep? It started happening so many times that it was becoming a place where I'm thinking, what's going on? I'm beating myself up and one day the Spirit of God came to me and said, wake up. Every time you're going into prayer, you're allowing that Spirit to come and make you drowsy and try and press you down. He said, get up, start walking around, shake it off. So now I go on my prayer walks, I'm wide awake. If I'm not, I'm going to fall down the curb or... But you see, the enemy will try anything he can to stop that communication, that communing with the Father. Laziness is a killer of prayer. We can watch TV, but come to pray. Well, I'm telling you right now, the next time your body says, no, I'm too tired. You call Rabbi Shando Romamando, Rasokaya, and you watch what happens in 10 minutes. You see, communication is to commune. Commune speaks of relationship. Relationship will take you into intimacy, and intimacy will always reveal the sonship you have in God. Without it, you'll never, ever hear the Spirit of God clearly in your life. There are many times I go into prayer and I don't speak a word. Why? Because I've learned God's got a lot more to tell me than I have Him. You see, the devil knows the power of prayer. You've got to understand that Satan once had intimacy with the Father. He once had a relationship and a union with God. When he fell, his intimacy was stripped, his identity, everything that he was, was taken away. And that is why he lost his power. When you don't pray, you will lose your identity. And when you do, the power flow dries up. Pastor, when I first met him, we were talking. He said, son, I'm so thankful that God's using you. He said, but son, no matter what happens, you better have that time with the Lord. Because one day you'll try and write a check and this time it'll bounce. You see, when you're walking in intimacy with God, you, you sign that check. I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about when you say, in the name of Jesus. Every time that check cashes, it cashes. Prayerlessness. Young people that are playing with sin, you don't realize it. You think you're okay right now. You think you can outwit the devil? Son, he'll run rings around you. Daughter, he'll make you look like you don't know what day it is. Oh, but when you pray... Oh, but when you've been with the Father, He can't play with you anymore. Oh. Because before He even makes a move, you've already seen Him coming. The hand of the Lord is upon you. can you be powerful in God? How can you stand before hell itself and preach the gospel when you've not been the, the author of the book? Yeah. 
A.J. Gordon, a great man of prayer, he said this, you can do more than pray after you've prayed. But you can never do more than pray until you've prayed. Oh, I need to say that again. You can do more than pray once you've prayed. But you can never do more than pray until you've prayed. I love this. Revelation 5 speaks of angels around the throne of God having in their hands bowls of incense which are the prayers of the saints. Let me tell you what prayer is to God. It's an incense in his nostrils. There's something about prayer that the Father just can't stop being drawn to. Help me, Jesus. Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing. Now that's not about being in, in your room seven hours a day. That's about walking in union with the Spirit of God. You can be at work. You can be driving the bus. You can be at the cash out desk. But your spirit is called Jesus, I love you. I love you, Lord. There are times that I'm walking, I'm not praying, but I've received some of the greatest words in my life when I'm just thinking about the Lord. You're wonderful, Jesus. You're wonderful, Lord. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Yes, baby, we'll have steak. Oh, but Jesus, I love you, Lord. See, I'm talking about prayer that will turn the tide. I'm talking about prayer that can change a destiny of a nation. Now, I know some of you are not quite there yet. But believe me, by the power of the Holy Ghost, you're going to be. Luke 11, 1 says this. Now, it came to pass... As he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say this, our Father who art in, where is the Father? Hallowed be thy name. Men and women who pray, they know the power of that name. When you speak that name into an atmosphere, every spirit, every devil knows that name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom manifest. What do we want the kingdom of God to do? Come. Where? Where? As it is in see to understand prayer you got to understand the three realms that the Bible speaks of there are realms spiritual realms and natural realms that the Bible speaks of that prayer infiltrates every one of them the first one that I want to talk about which is actually the third one is this it's the third heaven this is where father dwells this is where the throne of God is. The thunder, the lightning, the cherubim, the seraphim, the angels, the 24 elders bowing. That's what the Bible calls the third heaven. Why? Because Paul said in 12, 2 Corinthians 12 that he was caught up into the third heaven. By the Spirit of God, he was taken into that realm. He heard things. He saw things that he couldn't even talk about. Oh, Lord, take me there. Take me there. Just in case you thought that that was just for him, you'll find Ezekiel went there, Daniel went there, John went there. If they went, I want to go. He called it paradise. 
It was a realm of revelation that God took him to that was not of this world. And yet God took him there that he might bring it down to where? The second realm I want to talk about, and I'm just going through this quickly because I'm going somewhere. Believe me, I'm going somewhere. Is what the Bible calls heavenly places. Ephesians 3.10 says, to the intent. That means we were made for this purpose. That now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by who? By who? Oh, some of you need to read your Bible. Come on. The manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Is anybody awake here? By the church. Come on, say it louder. By the church. To who? To the principalities and powers in heavenly places. You see, God is birthed in the church, not just to sing songs and have a happy, clappy time, but to come to a realm in Him in prayer, in word, in deed, that it releases into the heavenless, to principalities and powers, the manifold wisdom and glory of God. Ephesians 6 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Remember this against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Where? In heavenly. Now you've got heaven, you've got the throne room, you've got all authority, and then you've got somewhere that the Bible calls heavenly places. The third realm I want to speak to you, and I'm laying a foundation, is the earthly realm, the natural realm. Now for the kingdom of God to come, God wants to release from His throne, His Word, His Spirit, that it will manifest in the natural realm on earth. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in is there sickness in heaven? No. Is there oppression in heaven? No. Is there depression in heaven? No. Is His word compromised in heaven? No. Are you defeated in heaven? No. Then there's a place that God by His Spirit has got to take us to where we don't just talk about it, we walk it, we live it, we see it, we breathe it. I tell you what bugs the life out of me. Why healing evangelists are a rare breed. I love that people have traveled from all over the world. I love that they watch all over the world. But my God, why isn't it happening in their church? In our lives? I'll guarantee you go to the root. There'll be a lack of the word. There'll be a lack of prayer. And there'll be a lack of the spirit of God. You see, when you learn the war that is taking place in the heavenlies, you will suddenly realize that prayer is not an option. It's not an option. It's your lifeline. It's going to cause you to breathe. It's going to cause you to be strengthened. I want to tell you that war in the heavenlies is increasing. You better know that Satan is advancing upon the nations. Why? Because God's letting him. In order for the end times to take place, there will be a war in the heavenlies 
principalities and powers will begin to take hold and take strongholds. And while ever you're praying for your gerbil and your budgie and whether you've got enough bread in the pantry, we got to get to a realm where we walk in a place that I already know God's my provider. You see, when he said, give us our daily bread, I don't think he was talking about a loaf in the cupboard. He was talking about spiritual bread. Let your word come daily into my heart. Let it burn like a fire in my bones. You see, in order to be victorious and strong in the Spirit of God, you must understand who you are in Christ. I'm not talking just about your sins are forgiven and you're going to heaven. No, no, no. That's awesome. That's the gospel. But you need to know who you are in Christ here on earth. And for that, you need to go to the beginning. It's always a good place to start. You see, when Adam fell, when Satan came to Eve and Adam fell, I want you to see what happened. Something took place that was so spiritual. You see, Adam had such a union with God that he walked with him. When the father looked at Adam, he even allowed him to name his creation. He said, Adam, what do you want to call that? I'll call that a cow, Lord. Then a cow it'll be. He walked with him. He had union. He didn't know what it was to be without the presence and the glory and the authority that God had given to him. I'm tired of Christians walking around with no authority on their lives. We need preachers with authority on their lives. You see, God said, let us make man in whose image? In our image. In other words, he made you just like him. You know why Satan hates you? What a union. What a place. But you see, when Satan came against Adam, he had no authority, he had no power. Adam had been given dominion over him. He was not powerful. He couldn't just go to Adam and say, I'm going to take that authority. Adam had to give it to him. When Adam fell, he gave the authority to Satan by right. Satan didn't take it and God said, oh, give it him back. No, Adam gave it to him by right. You see, everything God does is righteous. When Esau sold his birthright, he couldn't just take it back. What Adam gave away could not just be reversed by an angel coming and saying, Oi, give it him back. Adam gave every authority that God had placed on his life into the hands of Satan. And with it, the hands of humanity. See, the Bible says that where the, second, the first Adam failed, the second Adam was victorious. Yeah. You see, when Jesus came... He couldn't just go to the devil and say, devil, I'm here, give it to me. Jesus had to take it back from Satan by right. And the only right he had was to sign the check with his own precious blood. Oh, I wish you'd give Jesus some praise. See, the Bible calls Satan the ruler of this world, the prince of the air. He dwells in heavenly places. Amen. 
that's why when Satan came to Christ in the wilderness and he said I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world as far as your eye can see if you just bow the knee Jesus didn't look to him and say hey they're not yours to give Jesus didn't look at Satan and say no you can't give me them but you see, when Adam handed that authority, Jesus had to pay the price to give it you back. That's the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. John 12. You see, in his rhythm, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Why do you pray? Let me tell you why. And I promise you, unless you've seen it before, you will have never even guessed it. The Bible says... In 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we, everyone say we, we. say me, we. say I, I become the righteousness of God. That is one of the most powerful scriptures you will read in the whole word of God. If you allow the spirit of God to give you revelation you'll realize why you pray. We are the righteousness of God. The blood is upon our lives. See, let me show you something. Can I show you something? Woo, you're going to love this. In Jesus' name, you're going to love this. The Bible speaks of three realms. When you pray, you need to understand what is happening. You see, Jesus did not come to change the law. He came to fulfill the law. There is a law to sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is when there is sin in a nation, when there is sin in your family, when there is sin in your life, you need to know what you are doing. You are giving the authority back to the devil. When nations accept abortion, when nations do not stand for truth, I want to tell you that there are forces that begin to take hold. The Bible speaks of principalities. I'm going to go through these quickly. The Greek for that is archas. It means a chief ruler or being of the highest rank in the order of Satan's kingdom. Let me tell you, principalities don't mess with you on a Monday morning. They got better things to do. Principalities rule nations. They come because of sin and take hold in a nation. When a principality takes dominion, you better get ready because every demon of hell will come and bring the fruits of hell in everyone's life. The next one the Bible says we war against is powers. The Greek is exousius. It's an authority and it derives its power and executes the will of the chief ruler. When a principality takes hold of America, when it takes hold of Alabama, you better get ready because the powers of hell will begin to come and release the will of Satan. Why do you think covens are coming around this building, laying out their dead birds? Witches coming to stand here to try and marry me in the spirit. You think they're playing a game? Do you think they're playing a game? No. They're trying to take hold. The third one is the rulers of the darkness of this age. That is the word kosmokratopas. It means a world ruler of the darkness of this age. This spirit infiltrates governments and kings. 
When you're praying, you better know how to pray. When you're praying for your next president, you better know who's in the White House. Because it ain't just the president. If you don't think that there's a fight over the White House that has nothing to do with voting, then you're blind to what really is going on in the heavenlies. Host of wickedness, pneumatica poneirias. These are what we call demons. See, when you start to walk in a realm with God that you're praying for a nation, just like Daniel, you'll see that there's a war. You see, when the angel came to Daniel, he said, I would have been with you sooner. But I was fighting the prince of Persia. The principality stood to stop the word coming forth. But notice that as long as Daniel prayed, the breakthrough came. Why? 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 When Satan can look at a people and say they are mine by right. They are mine because of sin and the law of sin. But suddenly, from a, a church in CHP, or from a revival called the Bay, there comes somebody walking that there's something different about them. Filled with the Holy Ghost. The blood is upon them. Where suddenly Satan has a right. Suddenly the righteousness of God begins to take hold. And it begins to cry, Father, forgive them. Move them. Save them. Let me tell you what prayer will do. It will give God the right to move. It's argument. Satan has to let them go. Somebody give Jesus some praise right now. Woo. Come on, church. Come on, church. Oh, come on, church. You can do better than that. says that we are the salt and the light if the salt loses its saltiness if the light hides it away what good is it because of prayerlessness and the lack of love for revival we handed over our heritage back into the hands of the enemy When you don't pray, you don't realize that Satan has an argument why God cannot move. God must find a man or a woman that will come into line with his will, his purpose, his word and release it on earth so that heaven might come down on earth as it is in moves the hand of God you see when Satan beats you up and tells you you're in shame and guilt how can you stand with boldness and say devil get out of here Amen. when I stand on this pulpit by the grace and mercy of God I don't stand here 
as Nathan. But when that sickness looks, I pray that I'm so enshadowed by the Holy Ghost that he, that sickness doesn't see me. He sees the healer. He sees the creator. And he must go. Why? Because we are the righteousness of God. And his word is yes and amen. Woo! Now you might get me preaching this morning. When I go into a place, you must understand and have a revelation from the Father of what is happening over that place. You see, this revival is battled against a spirit of division and apathy that is over Mobile. I have to battle that every week, but it doesn't have victory. You'll find that wherever there are non spirit filled, baptized, Holy Ghost, fire, men and women of God, you will always find a dominion of Satan. Right. See, the Bible says the effective, fervent prayers of a what? Of a what? my servant Job Satan go ahead make my day give me a reason to bless him all the more you see the Bible says that Satan goes before the father day and night the accuser of the brethren he tries to take the right to take them out but the blood the blood the blood the blood the blood, the blood will always Cancel him out. Woo! Can I show you something that really blessed me? No, in fact, I don't want it to bless you. I want it to radically mess you up. The Greek word for prayer is to crave, to desire, to require, or demand. That word speaks of something that is due to a family member by birthright. See, when I go home and meet my mom and dad, I don't go into that kitchen and think, I'm hungry, but I didn't open the fridge. I walk in that kitchen, not arrogantly, but because I know I'm loved. I open that fridge door and I take whatever I need to get me through the day. Oh, if we would only pray. Some of you need to start to demand your healing and stop listening and whimpering to the voice of the enemy. Tell him to get out. Why? Because the blood says so. I was on with pastor this morning and I told him I was in prayer and God gave me a word and he said this, next year, right at sometime at the beginning of the year, we, we've seen a great outpouring. I mean, uh, every week. I mean, I pray that not one of you ever gets used to seeing signs and wonders. If you feel yourself taking it for granted, slap yourself up the side of the head. You know, we're getting to a place, and, and I try and keep myself raw. That's why I get excited about it. We got a woman, a boy who's deaf. We got a woman that's had five strokes. We got a woman that was having seizures in wheelchairs. These people are crippled up, and we come back and we say, we had some really good services. Good? How 
How's about awesome? How's about he tries us to our knees to say, more Lord, more Lord. Well, the Lord said to me that in the next year, I believe in the first half of the year, but the whole year, there will be a word over this church, over the revival. And the Lord said to me that there's a door that is open. And it is the doorway to destiny. And what was left ajar is now swung wide open. Walk through it, believe it, and take dominion in my name. The doorway to destiny. When you pray, I want to tell you that there are doors that will open that were never opened before. Why? Because if you don't speak it, you'll not see it. If you don't believe it, you'll never walk in it. You've got to give God a place to move in your life. And prayer will pave the way for the blessing and the power of God in your life. Psalm 78 says this, Yet he commanded the doors of heaven and rained down on them manna for them to eat. Men ate the food of angels. You know what the food of angels is? you got to study Revelation of what happened to John when they put something in his belly. But I can't go there right now. The food of angels is Revelation. When they ate that manna, they got a revelation of God's goodness, provision, power, and might. When you pray, revelation always flows. You want to see a miracle? Get a revelation about healing. You see, you can pray for the sick while ever a preacher tells you to. But the second Jesus shows you, Where you're not praying, say, Jesus, please. You never see anybody, anybody that has the power of God on their lives that looks at sickness and says, please, Jesus. Or I just, I can't stand it when I hear preachers say, Lord, if it's your will. My God, it is his will. <laughs> Jesus said to sickness, go. When I pray, I ask God, God, give me the boldness. I'm not asking that sickness. Blind eyes, open. Deaf ears, open. Why? Because I had a revelation. And with revelation will come authority. Are you getting something out of this this morning? The Bible speaks about doors that we are to pray to open. Colossians 4.3 speaks about the door of utterance. There is a door that will suddenly allow the word to be spoken with power. If you study the book of Colossians 4.3, it will link, it's the anointing of the spoken word. It links with Matthew 9.38 to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the laborers, sorry, the harvest field. When I go into crusades, I pray for that word to be open, that door to be open. That when I preach, it's like a net. When you see me give an altar call, I'm not saying, well, if you feel it, just come. Right now, get out of your seat. Get into the altar. Right, what am I doing? I'm taking that net and by faith, I'm pulling it in. I'm pulling it in. I'm taking it out of the hands of the enemy. By right, in Jesus' mighty name. Now this is what we need to pray for in the coming months. Acts 14, 27 speaks of the door of faith. Every one of you have been given a measure of faith, but there is another realm. Some of you come to Christ and you're, you have a measure of faith. 
Some have greater measures of faith. But that's not where you're supposed to stop. That's purely where you begin. But there is a realm of the gift of faith. The night that Delia walked, it was not my faith. A gift of faith came. That's why the atmosphere became electrified. There are nights that I come out of the revival and I might have done something crazy. Some nights I'm playing it back in my mind. I said, did I really shout out, bring the blind? I mean, Jesus, what was I doing? Those with cancer, come here right now, Jesus. But in those moments, that door is open to me. And when it is, when I walk in, I'm as bold as a liar. Because I feel Jesus with me. I feel him saying, son, go for it. I'm with you. See, the Bible says in Samuel that when these signs take place, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you, you shall become another man. When this happens, find whatever your hand is to do, for I will be with you. How many want a gift of faith in their lives? I'm not talking to drive a Ferrari. I'm talking to enter a realm with God where the devil knows your name. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 16, 9 writes, Paul writes, a great and effective door is open to me and there are many adversaries. There's a door that opens for evangelism. God spoke to me and said, In the next five years, I will give you one million souls. I had three men of God come to me and say, every year, or was it every two years? Maybe two years. God is going to double it and double it and double it. And double it and double it and double it. See, we need a great and effective door to open to us in this church, in our lives, and prayer will prepare you for it. Think of all the times that you haven't prayed and God was waiting for the right to move in your life. There's a realm in prayer that God has revealed to my life that has been a revolution. It's a realm that I uh, didn't know much about until God began to open up to me His word of knowledge in my life. Jesus said that I only do that which I hear. And in other gospels it says, see the Father do it. That means that when he was in prayer all night, there was a realm of revelation that, that, that Jesus entered where he could see what God's will was, his purpose was, that when he was in that moment, in that place, he could confidently, boldly walk in it because he already knew it was the will of God. That's the power of knowledge. When God tells me I'm going to heal, we were driving in, in the... In the uh, in the coach and pastor said to me, listen, this, this week you're going to have a major miracle. I said to him, okay, pastor. Two months before I came, three men of God, one from Reinhard Bonnke's ministry, another two great men of God came to me. They said, listen, God's about to give you a major miracle. When it does, it will go around the world. Now, how many know when that revelation had entered my belly, when Delia was sat there, I knew that I could be walking through that doorway of destiny. You see, if God can take you out of apathy and into a realm where you seek His face, He will show you things that are about to happen before they do. And when they do, when that moment arrives, you'll run into it. Before a service, I say, God, give me the keys to unlock the door. When I say in a meeting, there's somebody with blind eyes, God's about to open them, and then God opens the eyes. What does that do in the building? 
It releases, shout it. You see, when you can see what the Father wills in your life, when it happens, it will release others into a new place of revelation in their lives. In this revival, not because of a man, but because of God, people are seeing signs and wonders in their lives. Young man, have you seen miracles in your life since this revival's happened? You've seen healings? Yesterday? Why? Because as they've been in this realm, revelation has flown to their lives. It has entered their hearts that they no longer look at sickness with the same eyes anymore. Give Jesus a mighty shout. See, let me tell you, one man's encounter will lead another man's depths of revelation. Paul got taken into the heavenly realm and he wrote 60% of the New Testament. There's no shortcuts in the kingdom. My wife knows that sometimes I just need that time. I gotta be alone with God. I have to agonize some days. Sometimes when I walk out on the pulpit and I know the television is there and People talk to me about pride. I don't know about pride. It scares the living daylights out of me. I said, Jesus, just be with me one more time. Let me be in that place just one more time. People wonder why I kneel when I come in. You know why I kneel? Because that's the only place I feel safe that I can humble my life. You want to know why you're weak? Because Satan has stolen your lifeline. There's a door standing open. There's a new place that you need to be in and you know this morning more than every word I've spoken that you need to be there. That's that yearning in your heart. That's that cry in your belly. That's that. When you, has anybody become so, oh, just in a place where you say, God, either you come down or I'm coming up there. give you a key to go up there you must first go down here if you go into the secret place of the most high that which is done in secret God will reward before all men Lydia just come quickly right now You know, I feel, I feel a reverence of the Holy Ghost here right now. And that normally comes when the power of God is about to hit this place. Play. 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 Oh, play, Lydia, play. Play. Is there anybody here this morning that says, by the power of God, I want to know who I am in Christ? I know you think you're insignificant 
But the one who's on the inside of you, he is not insignificant. And the second you see yourself, how he sees you. You see, when the devil looks at you, when you know who you are in Christ, he does not see you. He sees the one inside of you. Young people, you can walk in this now, not in 50 years. In my short walk with God, I've sat with preachers that are twice my age. And they are fathers to me. But in the kingdom of God, age is not the same. Age comes with obedience and action. Some of you have been waiting for something that this morning God is going to bring alive. He's going to raise it up. You thought it had died, but it never died. It never died. That door is open right now. Do you know who you are? I want to tell every principality and power, they are the redeemed of Almighty God. I dare you to ask God to put His Word in your mouth. Some of your prayer lives are about to be shaken. Some of you have been groveling just to get a morsel of bread. But when the fire of God gets on you, you begin to realize who you are in Jesus. Not because of what you did, but because of what He did. Stop lying down. Rise up. What do you need? Come here. Give me a hand. Do you believe it's God's will for you to be healed? Close your eyes. Now church, you stretch your hands out and you take every word that I've just preached my guts out and you speak it out of the inner man. You speak to leukemia. I can't hear you, church. You command that sickness to loosen. Lord, in the authority of Christ, I command leukemia. Die! Die! Prayer team, prayer team, get on that woman right now. Stand to your feet all over this place. There's a wall. We're going to speak into heavenly places right now. You've been in revival, you've seen the glory of God. If ever there's a church ready to step into this. Now we're going to begin to speak into the heavenlies. You know those things that are holding your family back? You're going to begin to speak to them. You better get ready, I'm telling you. <laughs> You're going to feel something break. Something break. Addiction will be broken. Not because evangelists prayed. Because you're going to speak with a mouth of revelation. Some of you are going to speak into your family. And today, in Jesus' mighty name, I don't care how the past 20 years have been, change will come.
Now, are you ready? The worship team, you're going to sing in the shadow of his wings. And you're going to begin to speak. I don't need to tell you what to speak. You're going to speak into your family. You're going to speak whether you feel to speak over nations, over this revival. Whatever it may be, you're going to cry out that the power of God is going to fall across this building. Go ahead right now. Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you want to see more from Shake the Nations, please click the subscribe button below for brand new content, brand new messages, miracle testimonies, worship from around the world. Also, you can go to www.shakethenations.com. Don't forget, subscribe right now.